from the very full and uh, I welcome all of you uh, also on behalf of Lena Office Court to this uh, session on uh, metadata and legal aspects. So the structure of the session will be like this. We will split the six papers into two sets of three. Uh, the first dealing with the legal aspects and the second set with the uh, metadata issues. Um, and we would do it like this. We will give each paper. So now we are going to this first session of three papers. Um, each paper will have a, a pitch of, his, uh, of, of, of the paper in one minute. Uh, and then after we have had the three pitches, we go to some questions that we would like to pose to the authors. Now, I'm well aware the pitch of one minute must be uh, horrendous for people in the legal domain, but uh, I, I hope that you, that you can manage. So let's see how this works. So for the first paper, uh, the framework on uh, sharing language data, the perspective of personal data protection, who is the speaker? I think it should be me, I guess. No, all right. Okay. And uh, you sorry, are? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Alexei Kelly. Okay. I, I had technical issues. I, I so these links are very complicated. Okay. Things. Well, please try. One minute. You have it. So basically, the, uh, our research is about contractual framework for sharing data. The issue is that uh, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, has many requirements and liabilities. And the question is that who is really responsible when something goes wrong? And our research paper focused on uh, actually our paper focused on research settings, which involves academic freedom, research mobility when researchers move from one place to another, consortia issues because very often there are like many universities together, and consortia at the end of the day is just a contract. The question is that who is responsible then, and of course infrastructures such as Clarin, and. Uh, uh, in GDPR context or general data protection regulation context, sharing is actually processing data because processing is defined so widely that it covers any operation. Whatever you do with data, it's called processing. It's, it's called processing. So, sorry, we have some slides, but, but I just concentrate on my, um, my, my speech at the moment. Uh, yes. uh, so, and GDPR, GDPR, GDPR says that actually the person who is responsible is a controller. And controller is defined as natural legal person and who determines, uh, determines the purpose and means of processing. Basically says why to process and how to process. Yes. Uh, and, and the key issue is that whether a university is responsible or employees or, or researchers are responsible. Actually, the key issue here. The, the key issue, issue here is, and, and actually there are different approaches. For instance, at the University of Tartu in Estonia, university defines itself as controller. But we have also, um, as my, this French experience, when, for instance, head of some institute could be responsible. I, I think this issue, one way or another, has to be unified within the European Union. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, Alexei, I have to stop you here. You've uh, spent your one minute and you have made your uh, uh, topic very clear. So that's, uh, that's not an issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, let's proceed to our second uh, paper, uh, um, which is by uh, Grundhammer, Hannes Schläger and Trocknitz. Um, so it's on uh, going to the Alps. So who is going to bring us to the Alps? Uh, I am taking you to the Alps. Hi, uh, can Hi. you see me? Yes, Vanessa, okay. yes. Okay, hi. Um, yes, uh, my name is Vanessa Hanneschlieger mm. and um, I, um, I have the privilege to speak also in the name of my two co-authors. Um, in our paper, we described a tool that we came up with at the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage of the Austrian Academy of Sciences because we are not lawyers and uh, neither are any of our colleagues. And um, for quite a while we have been dealing with, um, well, all the, all the very different um, legal aspects that come up in the course of a research project. So um, we collected information on the various aspects, legal aspects that such as the GDPR that we just heard about. Um, and at some point we realized, okay, so we, we need, um, we need to provide some sort of structured support for our colleagues at the Institute, which is when we came up with the ALPS, which, which stands for ACDH Legal Issues Project Survey. 
Um, yeah, this is um, a tool that focuses on, on various different aspects such as um, imprint issues, um, such as software licensing, uh, reuse of data, um, of course, also data privacy, and um, we'll be happy to share uh, more detailed information on the tool and um, how it can also benefit the wider Clarin community um, in the discussion and in the breakout sessions later. Thank you very much, Vanessa. All right, so our third paper um, is by Paweł Komocki. Um, well, what size? Tell me, Paweł, size uh, matters. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm Paweł Komocki from IDES uh, Mannheim, and my paper is inspired by a question that I was asked by my colleagues who wanted to publish a list of engrams and associated statistics uh, from a large uh, corpus. In my analysis, based on German, uh, French, and European case law and legislative debates, um, I discussed three approaches to the problem. The first one is based on the classic theory of originality. The second one on more modern theory of recognizability. And the third one uh, pertains to the recent debates around the meaning of very short extract in uh, the right of press publishers <clears throat> created by the uh, directive, um, recent directive on copyright in the uh, digital single market. My analysis uh, led me to conclude that uh, three grams are generally in the green, that is, they can be freely reused. The use of seven grams is in the yellow, uh, that is, it involves a degree of risk that to many may be acceptable. Uh, whereas excerpts longer than 10 grams are risky to use and should only be used where some identifying elements such as named entities are removed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. All right, this is a good uh, appetizer. Um, let us go to two questions that uh, um, all of um, the papers uh, were asked to, uh, to, to give an answer to. Um, so I think perhaps we can best do it like this, uh, both we, for, for each paper, we have both questions. Um, so the first question is to which extent is the individual research responsible for the collection of research data and for the infringement of the GDPR if it might occur? And to which extent do they have the role of a data controller instead or apart from, from their employ employer? So that's the first question. And the second one is we all work in an academic context at national level, but our involvement in Claren demonstrates that we think broader in European context. So to what extent can you broaden the solutions that you propose in your papers to a general European standard? For example, is it possible to come to a Claren code of conduct for Claren partners? Um, so for our first paper of uh, Alexei Kelly and, and, and others, what, what would, would you reply to these two questions? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, basically, the, basically, the question is that uh, although university is responsible, uh, but uh, I, am, I have some kind of contractual arrangement with university. One way or another, it's, it's not that researchers can do whatever they want. They are responsible. Uh, uh, I, I actually, actually, I am in, uh, responsible before my university. But, but why usual organizations are responsible because they have more money and something happens, then data subjects are persons whose data is misused, uh, likes better uh, this kind of organizations which have money and which easier to get money because usually individual researchers don't have so much money. Basically, something happens, university first has to pay, and, uh, and, and then university deals with, it, with its employees later. But, but of course, it depends, it's more or less, I think, this is the uh, uh, context. Yes. And the second question. And the sec second question is that, uh, is how it's in broader context or, but, or, or general European standard. I think that one one way one way or another enforcement takes place within your jurisdiction, specific jurisdiction. And and when I do something, one way, I have to be sued in specific country. I think that, mm -hmm. and in broader in broader European context, I think that actually the GDPR provides the same standard, which means that I shouldn't infringe any anyone's rights, and when I'm not infringing, then nothing happens. And this is European context. But but when it's litigation, it's most likely national litigation. Right. Thank you. 
Okay, let's go to um, our second paper. And um, is it you, Vanessa, again, that will answer our two questions? Um, I'm hoping that my colleague Martina Trognitz will join me and help I'm, me in answering the question. I should be questions. online. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. yes I hear yes. you. Hello. Hi. So, Hello, Martina. I'm Martina. Um, yeah, so for the first question, um, uh, the researchers at the Austrian Academy are responsible for the research and research data to all extents. Um, and this also includes copyright and the ethical questions and, uh, and obviously also the GDPR. Um, and we at the ACDH, as part of the uh, Austrian Academy, provide consulting for these questions. But uh, we are in no position to give like valid legal advice. Um, and the current um, contracts at the Academy also stipulate that the research data belongs to the academy, but um, all these uh, legal infringements and who is the culprit is not really, um, I think there was no, or there was no legal case up until now. Yep. And then for the second questions, um, many of the questions we're asking in the questionnaire apply to, I think, many of other European countries. And so I I think that the set of questions could be used as a basis for maybe a general piece of advice for all clearing partners. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So, yeah, I think an important aspect of what you, what you also mentioned is that um, um, in practice, it hardly ever occurs, and, and not even to my knowledge, and not at my institute, that people yeah. really want to retract data or thought their, their rights were infringed uh, in, in a research. So um, that's always that's also the practical thing that, uh, that matters here, and the risk that you run in the end. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you very much. You're um, let's go to our third paper. Pavel. Yes, uh, so my answer uh, to the first question would uh, be that this is unfortunately uh, awfully complicated and depends very much on uh, the national context and the institution. Uh, if we just want to apply the GDPR strictly, then the definition of a controller uh, is quite straightforward. It's the, an individual or an entity who alone or jointly with others uh, defines the means and purposes uh, of processing. So uh, applied to the context of research, I would say it depends on uh, how the particular project is organized and what are the roles of a particular researcher, a, a PhD researcher or, or, a, or an assistant uh, typically does not, I mean, he is just asked to process data in a certain manner, but he does not um, or rarely decides why, so for what purpose and how exactly using what means the data are going to be processed. Uh, so uh, such a, a, a lower grade researcher can hardly be regarded as the controller. Ho however, if someone uh, really takes uh, such decisions, uh, then there is a resp responsibility that comes with it. And these decisions can be taken by an individual or they can be taken um, at the level of an institution, uh, not necessarily the whole university. Personally, I would be surprised if it comes out that it's decided at the level of the university, but it can be decided at the level of a research team or, uh, or, um, or an institute or, or a faculty. Um, so it's all a matter of a case-by-case -case analysis. Uh, with, uh, with uh, power to, to, to decide comes responsibility. Uh, and uh, my answer to the second question will be much shorter. Uh, I think the general European standard is going to emerge sooner or later. And in the context of law, uh, sooner means 10 years and later means 100 years. Uh, so. <laughs> So yes, I, I do believe that we will have uniform uh, data protection law at some point. This is clearly the intention behind the GDPR. Uh, now uh, we are, of course, the crisis is not, the, the, the corona crisis is not necessarily the perfect context for enhanced co cooperation and collaboration and, and harmonization of legal frameworks. Uh, but I believe that eventually will be over with these difficulties and we will get back on the way of uh, working 
together towards uh, a common standard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you very much. I see there are some questions in the chat, but I think we have first to do the second round of papers and see if we have time for uh, uh, questions from the audience. I hand over to you, Elena. Yeah, but perhaps uh, we have a couple of minutes, so perhaps it's a bit better in now, Hank. To All right. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's okay. So I have a, a question. Um, do you take into account in your paper that the GDPR researchers also need to comply with ethical good practices, apart from the GDPR as such? Um, I don't know, uh, Esther, to who was this question actually? Um, yes, this question is actually to Alexei. Okay, Alexei. I, I, I think yes, why not? Because actually it comes, uh, actually this GDPR comes down to ethical issues, more or less. Basically what it says is that don't do bad things to other people. And, and so it just, just that has many, many provisions which, which describe exactly what this bad means. But, but yes, of course, it's, I think that it starts with ethical consideration and we have all these ethical committees when you can consult and ask that I should do it or not. And then I can consult with supervisor authority. Yeah, yes, yes. I think it's the most important first standard. If you do everything in good faith, then I don't think the GDPR is such a big issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the interesting thing is, of course, when uh, ethical uh, issues come into conflict with GDPR issues, but that's uh, quite something else we can't treat it right now. Okay, then one other question to Pavel. Um, do you agree that in the definition of the GDPR criteria on who is a controller can also come from national? or European legislation? For data sharing, should we need specific regulation as an ERIC? Um, thank you for this question. Um, it seems that the definition in the GDPR that is binding on national uh, authorities is clear enough. However, uh, yes, the, the application of this definition to a specific case is indeed left to uh, a, to the national authorities, which, however, are bound by the guidelines of the European Data Protection Board. And there are new guidelines that, that have just been adopted. They are open for consultation right now on the notion of controller. Uh, so um, in as much as the national uh, authorities can find leeway in between the GDPR definition and the guidelines of the European Data Protection Board, Yes, in this very constrained space, they are kind of free uh, to interpret and, and to decide uh, who is the controller and who is not. However, I do believe that this space is in fact extremely constrained and will become more and more constrained uh, as practice, common practice hopefully evolves within the European Data Protection Board especially. Um, do we need a, a special uh, framework, special regulation as an ERIC? Um, well, everyone would really like to have a special set of rules that only applies to them, right? Uh, and I believe uh, perhaps Claren would love uh, to have uh, such a specific set of regulations. However, I doubt whether, reg whether legislators uh, really find it practicable and desirable. Uh, what may happen, however, is some special rules regarding the European uh, Open Science Cloud, and perhaps these EOSC regulations can affect uh, Claren. I think there is a common consensus uh, around the, the, the fact that EOSC may need some special specific regulations. Uh, so uh, perhaps it will also impact uh, Claren, and in this sense, uh, we may indeed have some special rules uh, for us. Okay, thank you very much, Pavel. There's another question I see, but maybe we have time for that one later. We have now have to go to the second set of three papers. Lene. Yes, thank you. And uh, just in the same way as before, we will have the uh, three pitches and we will start, start with the pitch for the signpost for clearing. And it's by Dennis Arnold, Bernard Fizzini, and Thorsten Trivel. Who is going to take the floor? Uh, I am going to take the floor, Bernhard Fizzini. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what you see here is that we want to sell you signposts for Clarin. Signposts are supposed to 
replace the idea of a tombstone object that has to be inserted if you have to alter data or have to withdraw data due to legal reasons or due to reconverting it to another format. Um, a tombstone normally presents a problem that it has a different data format. And we suggest that you insert a, a signpost, which is a piece of metadata that points to the uh, resource directly and tells you about the history of changes. And if you always point to that, then even if you have to withdraw a, a resource or change it, you will always get good information to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Then we will continue to this paper, Extending the SIMD Universe, Metadata for Bioinformatics Data, Olaf Brandt, Holger Gausa, Steve Kaminski, Mario Trojan, and Torsten Trippel. And who is going to take the floor for this? So that would be me. This is Torsten Trippel. Um, well, in Clarin, we know that CMDI is a great way of creating metadata profiles that are tailored to the types of data. We have done so for multiple data types, such as text pro corpora, lexical resources, psycholinguistic experiment, etc. When we were entering into, into a collaboration with colleagues from bioinformatics, they were first smiling at us when we presented them with the solution to metadata modeling. But when we looked at the current situation, the metadata that the co colleagues wanted to gather for their research data and what was already collected, we noticed we can expand the CMDI universe into the bioinformatics direction. It turned out that we can take the best of various worlds, including METS metadata containers and a tailored CMDI profile use concepts defined by the community, but utilize the Clarin infrastructure. In the CMDI universe, we will have a new world soul, and that's bioinformatics. Thank you. And then we go to the CMDI Explorer by Dennis Arnold, Ben Campbell, Thomas Eckert, Bernard Pisini, Torsten Trivel, and Klaus Sinn. And who is going to take the floor for this? Uh, I'm going to take the floor. I'm Klaus Sinn. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, the CMD Explorer or the CMDI Explorer is a tool that uh, aims at supporting researchers to better access complex scientific resources via their metadata. So focus of the tool is really easy access to the research data that is being described rather than displaying metadata. And for CMD metadata that is um, uh, highly structured, that describes highly structured resources or that describes lots of resources, such functionality, having an easy handle to the research data that is being described is badly needed. The tool shows you a tree structure of the research data that is being described and for its leaf nodes, it attaches actions to them, such as view, um, download the resource, view a little bit of metadata about the resource or send the resource to the switchboard. SIMD Explorer also helps you to put parts of the resource tree into a shopping basket, so to say, uh, so to speak, and to download the basket as a zip file. So you can easily then work offline with the research data that you just conveniently downloaded with the help of SIMD Explorer. Thank you. And then uh, now we will go to some uh, concrete questions, each one for each paper, and then we will have a more debatable question in the end. Uh, to, to all of you, uh, three. Uh, so my question would be uh, for the signposts. These signposts, they should make it easier to be pointed to the latest version of a continuously growing corpus, as an example. How does signposts assi assist reproducibility? That I, when I need to extract exactly the data from a certain timestamp again, in a kind of automatic manner. Uh, so I think the first point we have to make is that signposts are not supposed to replace versioning. Uh, so uh, you still have to do versioning. And what sign signposts take care of is if, if a certain version is corrected or has to be somehow adjusted, um, then you fi can find that data again. Uh, 
And if the it has to be changed, uh, there will be a log that allows you to find um, the whether the data is still available uh, and how you can, and there might also be a pointer to the next best version of a resource. So uh, you, th in that way, it helps reproducibility because you know uh, whether you can still acce access exactly the same data, how to get the next best, next similar thing, which should of course deliver very similar results as well. Um, but it, uh, it's, it's one component in a system uh, of uh, how to make data available that solves a very specific area of problems. Thank you. Thank you. And then about our bioinformatics uh, world here, uh, as you write, there's a long list of steps in the experiments that has to be documented. And you also have in this way a long list of information sources that are available on different times. So can these metadata be continuously collected, structured and made available in, in the system that you kind of sketched for this? Or do you need some versioning for the metadata to support that metadata are produced in a number of processes? Well, the lab's workflow in omics research are indeed uh, highly automized. There's just the drawing of a sample. Uh, that means sticking the needle into something or someone and placing the cell material into the machinery. That's basically the only manual process. Everything else is modeled in software. Um, of course, the, uh, with the number of samples you draw, uh, the uh, amount of data increases and there's Though there are only four letters involved in, uh, in genomics, um, there is a huge amount of data. And uh, so the whole thing relies on automatic enrichment of the metadata when you want to archive this kind of thing. Uh, in the process, we thought of a model where we enrich the metadata in the creation process creating different versions. But at the end, we found out that um, uh, the um, researchers working with this data actually published the data at the end of the analysis pro uh, process. Bef any metadata in the process before that will not be visible. So we do not have to have anything like versions of metadata uh, besides for debugging purposes. Um, so, um, Having said that, that means um, there's a huge difference between what we usually see in uh, the Clarion community that people use um, data created by somebody else and elaborate on that. Um, in bioinformatics, it seems to be that uh, they would rather start with a fresh sample and create the whole uh, workflow ag uh, again and not necessarily elaborate on um, data that uh, uh, um, uh, is uh, being archived before. So in this sense, um, we do not need versioning though implicitly we have it because uh, all the automatic processes would enrich um, the metadata processes. And that's actually what we do. Uh, that um, um, so whatever whenever a process creates something that can be used for the metadata, uh, this will be written into a metadata file. Okay, thanks. And then for the la the third paper, how can the user easily keep track of the metadata on collection level when extracting a subset of data or where this or is there a way for the user to easily reference the path of the selected data in this complex structure? Because you have this sim to explore where you can find stuff deep inside something. Is there then an easy way to reference that? Yeah, so um, at the moment you can't. Uh, I, I, I um, mentioned the, the, the shopping basket idea. Um, and in the latest incarnation of the Cindy Explorer, the shopping basket is just a flat list of resources that you're interested in. We had a prior version where the hierarchical structure of the research data was being preserved, but without the underlying metadata. Um, we take this question as a 
well uh, as an incentive to explore what you can do within the Explorer. If you can somehow, somehow uh, craft uh, a metadata description for the subset that is being, in, uh, that is being of uh, interest for the user. Um, but that's a bit hard because if you have a SIMD resource that describes hundreds of resources and you pick uh, one file from this part of the hierarchy and another file from another part of the hierarchy, does it really make sense to have the, to, to have the metadata then a newly constructed metadata for your selection somewhere? Um, uh, you still have the PID of the resource. Um, uh, so that's a starting point, but I think we have to think what, what we can do there uh, within Cindy Explorer. As I said, the focus is not on a metadata display uh, thingy, the VLO can do that, it does it, does it quite nicely. It's more like getting a handle on the research data. Yeah, I agree, but uh, also to remember where you found it, it could be nice. Okay, yeah, yeah. but we will rush on to uh, question number two. And uh, that is, what do you see as an important next step to make the component metadata infrastructure, what we, in short, call SIMD for more, more use outside the clearing community. And we have this example from bioinformatics, uh, but uh, how, what is the next step that we should do in, turn, in clearing to make it more usable? Thorsten? Yeah, I would like to answer that. So of course, uh, um, so I'm kind of a CMDI evangelist, so I need to answer that. And, and of course, one of the things I would like to advocate is that we can be a little more aggressive and advocating our models and our procedures because, well, we, what we have is actually something really, really good because we can tailor our model to uh, the needs of the specific data types. Uh, and so this really works very well. However, we should not neglect there are other um, ideas out there. For example, in premise, we have a, so a, which is a different metadata standard. There's a huge, uh, there's a very elaborate way of um, uh, of modeling uh, the access to uh, resources. For example, of course, we could remodel this in the CMBI, but maybe it's a good idea to uh, use something like premise. Uh, in the METS container with a CMDI component. And I think this uh, uh, connection, this interweaving of uh, METS and premise and CMDI really would uh, make it very worthwhile um, um, uh, working with other communities because that really helps them to understand what we are doing with, uh, with CMDI on the descriptive level. Another thing that is really um, would really be helpful and where we really need to look into is I think that we uh, have a meaningful connection uh, of our, uh, our metadata files into the linked data world with Sparkle endpoints that really are connected to the other, to, to via authority files, for example to other uh, resources, uh, which uh, would really open up um, uh, to other communities as well. Thanks. Klaus, do you also have a comment on this? Uh, yes, maybe, maybe the answer is twofold. Uh, first, I, I think we should really appreciate in the Clamming community itself, what kind of uh, gem we have with uh, CMDI. Uh, I think we underuse it at the moment. I know that in Tübingen, we, we create very rich SIMD profiles and we use them, um, uh, but we, we should use them even more. Uh, and really, uh, you know, the, the, the SIMD garden of profiles that we have in the, in the Clarion concept registry and in the Clarion component registry, we, we should care about this garden and make it flourish. Uh, the second part of the answer um, is we need to cross boundaries uh, to the other disciplines who don't know Cindy. Uh, I have written a couple of converters from CMDI to Dublin Core to Mark 21 uh, to MOTS uh, and uh, some other standards uh, from the library world. And when you write converters, you know uh, that Cindy is much more expressive 
than these other standards, which are discipline independent. Um, so we should, we should, of course, promote uh, CMDI, but we should also uh, bridge our metadata descriptions to those of, of, of the other communities and uh, library worlds. Yes, and I would just like to hear, uh, Bernard, if, if you like to comment too, or? Yeah, maybe uh, I would also go in two directions. On the one hand, in our work at the IDS, we noticed it would be nice to not only show the flexibility, but also have the more standardized components uh, that are more generally usable, such as a, a task force is currently developing within Clarin. And I think maybe it's also good to show that you can use CMDI, for example, to implement concepts such as signposts or to show that you can build things like the CMDI Explorer, which uh, then show uh, that it's useful and that we have uh, applications that do nice things for it, which are interesting for everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I can see that we have also some comments in, this, in the, the chat, but uh, we are also facing only two minutes to the <laughs> end of this. Um, I see one comment is that we should promote uh, Cindy inside, uh, in, internally in, in the Claren countries before going outside. And uh, I think that's, of course, also an issue to go into. Okay, but then I think that we will conclude this session and we will thank all our all the authors of the papers and uh, who willingly also gave uh, speeches and pitches and answers to our questions.